going to pick on you if you could actually <laughs> lead us off here. Kind of describe these two different visions, the monochain versus the multi-chain future, and maybe this kind of door number three option, which you call the super chain. So give us your framework here. Yeah, so, okay. What's the context here? We have these chains, these great global trust layers, magic trusted computer in the cloud, right, whatever you want to call it. And obviously we're all very familiar that we want to increase the usage of these platforms and we need to scale. And so there's definitely a question of how do you do that architecturally, technologically. And there's, like you said, basically, I think two prevailing schools of thought here. There's a monochain. And the idea of a monochain is there's basically one big chain that we can really scale up, make it way faster, parallelize the heck out of it, and run the world's crypto on that. There are a lot of advantages that you get with that, right? One a huge one is you get composability, right? Your sort of flash loans and this sort of thing. And that clearly has economic efficiencies. There's clearly a UX boost when you're on Ethereum and you can move to any other Ethereum application really easily, use them both in one transaction, whatever it may be. The problem is that those are, by definition, monolithic and sort of all the transactions on them are the same. And so if you are sufficiently bullish enough on crypto, you should realize that there will be way more demand than could be satisfied by any one chain. And simultaneously, there should be classes of transactions that have different uh, security versus cost trade-offs, right? There are just some applications like a game or a really cheap NFT or whatever it may be that you don't want to pay for the world's, you know, state-resistant, you know, blockchain trust layer. So there's another point of view which kind of looks at that and says there should be many chains, the multi-chain future, and these should all sort of talk to each other slowly, and because we'll have many chains, we'll be able to scale more, and we'll have a more uh, sort of heterogeneous model, heterogeneous, I don't know how you pronounce that. Um, so I think those are the big two prevailing schools of thought that we have in scaling right now. In general, um, oh, hi, I'm Ben from Optimism Layer 2 Scaling Solution. Uh, so our view at Optimism is generally that these are basically two sides of the same coin, and that really, what is really gonna exist in the future is like the super chain, which has all those properties of a mono chain, but also has a heterogeneous model where some people can pay a lot for really secure transactions, and some people can pay a little for not, but you still have sort of one big composable chain, and it looks and feels like one chain. Anyway, so there's a little bit on how Optimism thinks about uh, scaling. I think that's a great framework to lay it out, and we kind of have representatives from maybe two of those different schools of thoughts, right? Uh, I, I didn't give everyone a chance to introduce themselves, but uh, maybe we could go around the horn, actually, and you guys could just say a quick word about where you're working right now, the project that you're working on, and we'll start there. Sure, yeah. Hey everyone, I'm Ilya, co-founder of Near Protocol. Near is sharded uh, monochain, <laughs> but uh, from perspective of school of thought, I actually fully agree with the the vision of actually having this spectrum versus a points of uh, you know it's either this or that, and so kind of allowing ability for users and for developers to decide where on the spectrum they need to be, right? From like you know highly composable. Uh, fast finality on, you know, on the sharded blockchain to, you know, moving on to having, like, their own shard to moving on to having their own, like, side chain, et cetera. Um, that's really definitely the part of the vision uh, kind of expanding beyond. Hi, everyone. I'm Mikhailo. I'm co-founder of Polygon, and Polygon is a multi-chain scaling platform. Again, I fully align with what, uh, <laughs> what Ben said and what Ilya said. We believe in the multi-chain future, and we believe that's the only viable future if we want to onboard the world uh, to this, this exciting new, new uh, um, framework or this exciting new network of value and people that we're trying to build with Web3. Uh, Polygon is the most adopted, I believe, uh, uh, blockchain scaling infrastructure platform, platform right after Ethereum with more than 20,000 applications at this moment. Uh, we cover, we are an agnostic platform and we cover a, a wide variety of infrastructures, uh, architectures, sorry, ever, uh, everything from fully independent TVM chains up to on the second part of the extreme, on the other part of the extreme, full blown layer two solutions. And we, working and onboarding these 20,000 applications, we definitely realized that there's, there's a lot of variety in terms of requirements. So enterprises have completely different requirements and expectations compared to web free native projects. And that's one reason why we decided to offer this uh, uh, um, agnostic approach and to support multiple solutions. Uh, the other reason is that we are still in the very early stage of this industry. We are trying to, I mean, we have this grand vision of onboarding the whole world to, to, to Web3. 
and we're really in the early stage of the industry. We will need years uh, uh, to, to, become, to basically build this robust infrastructure that can actually support this grand vision that we have. And in this, uh, at this point of time, we really believe that we need this flexibility in terms of technologies. Hey everybody, I'm Luigi from uh, Ava Labs, head of DeFi there. Um, really focused on building out another layer one blockchain. Avalanche has you know, a lot of different unique capabilities as it relates to scaling horizontally with something we call subnets. Uh, Avalanche also boasts a very new consensus mechanism which allows for sub-second finality while also um, not necessarily, you know, and while allowing the ability to increase nodes. So about 1,600 nodes at the, at the current time. Um, and then also, at the same time, we have very robust DeFi ecosystems about, uh, depending on how you measure, well, after the recent nuke, probably about six billion in TVL. Um, and, and, and so we are also taking a different approach, I think, than some of the other um, um, projects here in terms of how we want to scale. We tried to in increase block space horizontally by what we call these subnets. So we recently launched two of them. Um, one, both of them were in the gaming sphere, so they allow for separate instances of block space to be consumed without impacting the, what, what you might refer to as the primary chain, which is the Avalanche C chain. These are all EVM compatible, but uh, Avalanche also allows for custom VMs. It's VM agnostic on the subnet layer, so we are seeing experimentation with respect to people trying to build custom VMs for various purposes. Um, while you know, I think that's a very unexplored area, um, I think that you know, we'll see various institutional players come in and try to customize a VM for their specific purpose. Um, but at the same time, the most adopted part of Avalanche is the EVM compatible C chain that we have, so. Cool. Hey there, my name is Harry. I am one of the co-founders of Arbitrum. We are building a optimistic rollup on Ethereum uh, with general EVM support. Our goal is to build essentially sort of a cheaper, faster extension to Ethereum um, that provides users with the kind of experience, Ethereum experience that they know and love, except without the parts they don't love, like high gas fees and, and slow block inclusion. Um, and so we've been on mainnet for over a year now, um, and we have kind of most of the main dApps of Ethereum have, have bridged over to Arbitrum already um, and are supporting Arbitrum instances. And we're really excited to be here. And just to kind of throw one point on top of kind of the earlier discussion, one of the cool things that rollups kind of bring to Ethereum um, is the fact that you can have this sort of heterogeneous layer on top of the more monolithic layer, which is Ethereum. Um, and so you can kind of build out this sort of interesting conversation, like this interesting sort of composition where you can have sort of experiments and, and differences um, on the kind of top layer while well, depending on kind of a single shared layer underneath. So maybe to, maybe to frame that kind of um, the monochain versus multi-chain future into the more popular narrative that maybe you see on, on crypto and we can talk about it, is there's this kind of uh, like a battle, right, in between kind of um, ETH supporters, right, and folks that are building on Ethereum and then alternative layer ones, some of these newer layer ones, the nearest and avalanches of the world that have, uh, you know, cropped up in the last couple of years. So if I could kind of simplify into two schools of thought, right, ETH was kind of there first. There's this enormous emphasis on decentralization, extreme security, et cetera. Um, and the scaling solution for that was always going to be layer twos, right? That enabled you to reduce costs, but obviously took a little bit more time than folks would have wanted. Um, and some new kind of layer ones kind of cropped up to that allowed people to transact sort of more cheaply. Um, I'd be curious if that's like how you guys think about that in the developer community and people who are actually building these solutions. Like, do you see those as being fundamentally competitive? Do you see a world where all chains kind of coexist? Um, how do you view like the intersection of these different chains and opportunities? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think if you look at the history of Ethereum, one thing you said is like layer two has always been the future mm. of Ethereum scaling. I would counter that a little bit. I do think that there was a period of time before Ethereum started following a roll-up centric roadmap where there was a strong emphasis on sharding and specifically like phase two of sharding, which was the execution sharding. <laughs> and um, so I think that's what we see some of the other panelists, especially near up here talking about, right? Yeah, I remember those days when we were <laughs> going over all the two sharding designs. So in general, yeah, I think that's accurate. I, I think for the philosophy of optimism and rollups in general, like Ethereum is the gold standard of security and it has the social critical mass. And also, quite frankly, it came with all the values that we are really here to like, promote and double down on. Um, so in general, I agree. I think over time, layer two, the emphasis on layer two has grown much stronger for Ethereum. 
um, but otherwise agree. And Ilya, I know you're about to speak here. Maybe you could also, just for the audience, if they're not aware of what sharding is, if you could give a brief definition and then respond. Yeah, for sure. So sharding, kind of in general, is concept of parallelizing execution, running it on different machines. And so, you know, if you're using Google, if you're using Facebook, they don't store everything on a single machine. There's lots of servers, and the data and the kind of computation is distributed among them. Um, and so, kind of, the interesting thing is, like, the, the only way to scale is to parallelize things. Like independently of how you do it, like that's a way that's that's an approach everybody's taking. And if you think of rollups, uh, you pretty much just spinning up multiple rollups that are trying to parallelize things. Kind of you know optimism and arbitrum running in parallel, having its own block space, and then just settling on the same security layer, right? If you're thinking of Cosmos chains, well they're all running in parallel and only like communicate independently. If you think of um, you know. Polkadot, parachains, right? Again, they're running in parallel, and then you have a common core that actually settles in. And so, in a way, there's a spectrum from kind of like a fully monolithic, not, char not sharded, not paralyzed chain to, you know, Cosmos, where everything's paralyzed, there's no common security. And so, there's different kind of, you know, places in the spectrum where everybody falls. And kind of rollups live right, right on the side of like, hey, we're running in parallel, but we, you know, secure with the same layer one. But the kind of the issue with that, right, is now as a user, you need to be aware of which rollup you're on. Similarly with parachains, similarly with uh, Cosmos chains, etc. And so what these two original ideas were, right, and, and kind of us coming in from Web2 space as well, where, you know, we believe in simplicity for the users and developers as well, is user understanding exactly what chain they're on should not be part of the story, right? It should not be part of it. And like, eventually I think we're all gonna converge into some design that actually like hides all of this, but right Super now, chain. Hmm? Super chain. Super chain. <laughs> I mean, I, I think like it, it will be a combination of, yeah, you can have like different provisioned things, but the same account model, the same wallets, et cetera. And so we started in this space where we offer kind of the same experience, but underneath, the number of shards, the kind of the shard layout, where state is, can be completely like changed and redesigned, and that allows like that's very much modeled after you know how kind of Web two companies work, where you don't need to think about you know am I you watching a movie from like this data center or that data center, and you know am I on this shard of a Facebook server because you know they sharded their thing by universities or not, right? Like that's not something users need to think, and so that's really what kind of I would say like near is modeling after. And then on kind of within that, you can still have things like Aurora, which is EVM compatible uh, smart contract that runs on top. And actually from perspective of users, it looks like a rollup because it has kind of EVM compatibility, all this with its own RPC points that runs, and it has actually its own block space because it runs its own shard, but it actually is within the same model and so other contracts can call it. So in a way, it's a realistic rollup. And so what sharding is, is really a realistic rollups, meaning they get validated right away as the transaction gets submitted. Yeah, so to, to Ilya's point, basically sharding is essentially a parallelization. And I guess all of us, all these projects here are assuming some sort of parallelization, whether it's multiple rollups, whether it's homogeneous sharding, sharding whether, whether it's polygons multi-chain, whether it's avalanche set of subnets, this is all basically parallelization, or if you will, sharding in some more abstract way, I guess. Uh, so I, I guess we agree that's the only way to scale and, and reach the, the amount of scale that we need, again, to onboard the world to, to Web3. Uh, and uh, to your question about Ethereum versus other layer ones, if you will, I, I think with Ethereum, Ethereum basically introduced this grand vision, uh, at least in our opinion, of this global permissionless network of value and people and basically sold us this dream and it some sort of perfect storm happened with ethereum where so many people came together and even today you see teams all across the world you know popping up random people uh, starting their projects to build more of the ethereum infrastructure and it's we have never seen that yet we haven't seen that yet with any other layer one and i think it's going to be really hard to to replicate or to do that again with uh, any other layer one. That is my personal opinion, of course. Uh, uh, time might prove me wrong. But 
hence why we decided to build on the shoulder of the giant to be fully compatible with Ethereum and we are integral part of the Ethereum community and that really, uh, uh, um, that was a great decision for us uh, and the Ethereum community kind of embraced us and that's why we went from 30 applications within a year and several months to 20,000 applications today and that basically shows, that demonstrates the power of the, of the Ethereum community. But that being said, I think Maybe the bullish case for, for alternative layer ones is exactly what Ilya said, maybe one day, or what uh, Ben is mentioning, uh, this super chain, if you will, where we will have some sort of abstraction and users will not even know kind of what chain, maybe even what L1 are they using. So in my opinion, that might be the bullish case for, for alternative L1s. Yeah, I mean, I would have to agree. Uh, frankly, you know, the way I view it is we're all here because of Ethereum. That's kind of like, you know, they, they first opened the door for all of us, and, and, and now because of that we get to innovate and try and, you know, uh, build better. I, I, I'm not a big fan of um, an environment whereby there is only one chain that we're all building on top of. I think that's inherently risky. I think that's also inherently defeats the purpose of competition in the space. Um, I think we want a bunch of layer ones competing, um, you know, grinding and competing as much as possible to try and push the bounds of science and, and trying to end up with the, you know, uh, f most finalized, you know, the fastest finality of transactions, the most decentralized consensus. I think we want to find out what that is. You know, it, we're six years in here, maybe seven or so. Um, it's very, very early with respect to the science of some of this stuff, but we have come a long way in a short amount of time. With that said, you know, I think having four, five, ten, whatever the number might be of layer ones competing and battling for this, um, you know, I don't want to say grand prize because I don't think that's what ends up happening, but to actually innovate and compete with each other, I think that's the, an ideal scenario that everybody should want. I also think it's inherently risky to, you know, put everything on one major chain, you know. Uh, I know even if it's the most decentralized chain, super chain, or whatever it is, uh, you know, at a certain point, if anything goes wrong and every single financial transaction is settling upon that chain, I don't think we want an environment where uh, that's the only option. So I think it's good to have options. Yeah. Well, this has been covered really well already, so I don't have a ton to add. <laughs> um, but just to, to double down, I'd say, on, on a couple of things. I mean, I think that the idea of sort of continuing to, to drive innovation is, is kind of critically important. I mean, the Ethereum community itself has been doing it. You know, a lot of really, you know, impressive work going on at other L1s have been doing it. That, like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very confident that the blockchain space today is, is not what it'll look like in, in five years. It's not what it'll look like in 10 years. The amount of, of work going on right now in order to figure out how to kind of bring us to this sort of promised land of global adoption is, is critically important and, and very time critical. Um, because we need to sort of stay ahead of the adoption curve and kind of putting all our forces together in order to kind of really work to that mission is just so important. I've got a, I've got a, okay, I've got a couple of comments on what you all said. I do think, <laughs> I do think that um, the notion of competing L1s does have a counter argument, which is worth stating, which is that if you imagine a bunch of competing L1s and you imagine that they're competing for like some sort of decentralized security provider sort of supply curve, then it is, then you could argue that by having a bunch of these, you are distributing the security between multiple places and it would actually be more secure if it was all in one decentralized network, right? I think the only other thing that I would add is that I do agree that parallelization is kind of what we're all doing, but I think that to say that we parallelize, that rollups parallelize by having multiple rollups only is just evidence of the early parts of rollups that we've yeah. seen so far. So basically what's going on at Optimism right now is we have a huge push to be able to not just run the EVM, but run like arbitrary Golang, which is like arbitrary programs in L2. And I think once you have that, basically all of the sort of sharded L1 designs port right over to L2. So like we're expecting future uh, iterations of Optimism to literally be one rollup, but have the sharded parallelism properties within the one rollup. So I do think that if I were an L1 right now, I would take all the awesome execution stuff I would do, I would turn it into an L2, secure it onto Ethereum, and I'd be good to go. So, I, I mean, I'll take, I'll take the bait. We can, we can, close, we can close the panel. <laughs> I'll take the bait because I like Ben. Um, 
<laughs> I, think, I think L2s um, ha have a very, very, very important place, you know, and I think they're going to play an important role in scaling. Um, I don't think they are the best for certain things. Um, in particular, uh, finance is, is one of the things that I think is, is, is less optimal on a layer two than an L1. And, and, and just to play devil's advocate, what I'd say here is, uh, you know, one of the really nice properties of blockchains in particular is this ability to finalize a transaction super fast, um, especially from finance perspective. You know, if I am able to sell, settle large amounts of U.S. stocks, for example, on a blockchain, there's this really nice property if it's instantly final where I know that I'm not going to fail on settlements. Anybody who's worked in an operations department at a bank knows what happens when there's fails. You know, it, it leads to a domino effect of fails behind it. So I think having this instant finality of uh, transactions is super important. Obviously, there's a delay in between the time of execution and when that transaction is permanently final. Um, so I, I would say that from that perspective, there is you know, uh, a counter argument to that. In addition, I do think that um, you know, when you have a lot of capital uh, at place in a certain, um, I would say, you know, on a chain, you do want the security of a certain amount of value staked um, that is commensurate with the amount of value on the chain. So you don't want a scenario whereby you have $20 billion of TVL on a chain and $2 billion securing it. That's inherently risky. Um, so I think that you know, those two things combined would make me think that finance, there is a place for uh, you know, execution on L1 directly. But then wouldn't you want all of the security budgets to go on one chain? No, that's like the CME, right? Like, I mean, there's one place where everything can break. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, I think the main thing I would say is you get instant transactions and optimism too. So I agree that that's like important, but also you can make them more final by putting them on L1. I want both. I want both. I, so I agree. The funny part is, like line of near is that it actually settles on Ethereum. And by the way, like line of Ethereum is on near. So you know, wh who is L2 to whom is an interesting question. And and uh, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> I mean, but that's but that's. Will you be my L2? <laughs> but that's the question. Is like. From pers it, it, layer two is actually, first of all, a perspective thing, right? It's like you're saying, we're using this for security of that, but at the same time, you can say, like, from the other side, it works as well. There's whoever more, has more security in a way. So in this case, Ethereum does. But the part about that's important is actually the amount of data you need to push, right? Like, at the end, if you do want a full kind of, you know, full data available on the layer one that provides you security, you need to be able to push you know, megabytes and megabytes of data, which Ethereum at this point is not able to. And so... It will. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> um, and so right now, at least, right, like the, you know, building a layer one is really about actually data availability and fast finality. And so uh, from this perspective, like, you, the kind of the speed and performance that you can achieve to users, right? And to be clear, like we're getting new users into the space who don't understand why they need to wait for minutes or, uh, you know, even like tens of seconds if you like really bump up the tip uh, on Ethereum, they actually just want to use the apps, right? They like, you know, our focus always been like, how do we make this thing so simple that we can actually bring the, you know, billion users, right? Like right now, the existing experience, right? that you tr when you try to use, it's not, like, it's not something for people who are new to the space, right? It's not for the people who are non-technical. Like, we have people, like, we have factory workers using some apps on Near, right? We have people for, who, like, non-educated, non-technical, for whom Facebook was internet, they're using the apps right now. And that's, like, because they feel exactly the same. And at least right now, you cannot achieve that. And with choices that, at least East 1.x is making, you still cannot achieve that, right? Finality is still long. I mean, you, they are working on faster finality on uh, one beacon chain, but like that's not what what it is right now. And so, like, I mean, if there was a way to merge all those things into one kind of uh, joint experience, sure. But I think the choices are pretty different that people are making, uh, and choices f like. This was, you know, Vitalik posted this long thread of like his, his different things, but the thing that I did not see is choice between like actually making better user experience, right? That, that's not the choices that are being made right now when, they, when they're thinking of how to design Ethereum. And like from my perspective, that is the main choice. Like how do we make better user experience, how to make better developer experience, bring the users, and then 
ideally, like, we should solve the complexity of the behind the scenes, right? We should not push it on the user. Like, and sure, like, we'll eventually get there. Like, everything will be built, you know. We'll live in magical land of, uh, of everything, you know, interconnected and moving in, in microseconds. But right now, we're not. And so, like, what are we delivering now? What, how are we actually getting that in front of the users, right? Yeah, just to Luigi's, uh, sorry, Ben. I do strongly agree that instant UX is super, super important. If you go on optimism, you will get those instant confirmations. They're so good, I agree. And, and, and Arbitrum as well. <laughs> Just to, to Luigi's and uh, uh, Ilya's points about the fast, fast finality, you can certainly have that sort of fast finality uh, with rollups by replicating the model that we are all using today, which are basically credit cards or, or cards in general. So you can have local finality on rollups. I don't want to go too technical. I guess it's not, it's not the the right uh, uh, forum, but uh, you can have some sort of decentralized operators and have local finality, which is nearly instant, mm -hmm. and then you can have, sim in the same manner like with credit cards, you, ha you can have this final strong finality on Ethereum at a later point using fraud proofs or ZK proofs. But, but what whatever. happens when Ethereum decides to censor your uh, batch? Yes, but so that's the point of, the whole point of Ethereum is that it's impossible to censor anyone. That, that's why I mean, we have Ethereum. As the Google can roll back pretty deep. Like with all the GPUs they have. But That's the current POW. I, I mean, I, I it will change it, with POS. Yeah, but Ethereum is this decentralized network that cannot be affected and is completely unopinionated and just processes anyone, any transaction that submits enough but, gas, it will process. But that's not true. I can roll back a bunch of transactions, you know, and, and for a period of time make sure that nothing happens if I have enough GPUs. Yeah, so here's, here's kind of like, like... Okay, we're going now into some debate, then you can say anything can be rolled back, essentially, but... This yeah, with is, enough money, it's, everything is rolled back. That, that's a whole assumption. That, that this whole but thing practically, is economical. I mean, Th this is also that practically, anyway. it's practically, it's <laughs> fellas, impossible. Fellas, fellas. <laughs> All right. I mean, you knew this well, was happening. Like I know this is fiery. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But. <laughs> All right. One at a time, Mihilo. <laughs> yeah, uh, so as, as I was saying, so it's definitely possible to build something with five finality using, using roll-ups. And yeah, regarding GPUs, we can discuss that maybe some <laughs> other time, but practically it's not really possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole point. That's what you need to remember. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, think, I, think, I think also the point is that um, if there is enough value to extract, there could you know, be a scenario whereby you know, proof whatever gets rejected, something happens and you need to reorder transactions. If that happens, and let's say you're trying to settle stocks, Right? And you want to reorder the transactions, you know, post facto, whatever. I mean, that's a catastrophe. Like, you need to reorder the market. That's just, it's just not realistic. So we're not going to do this with finance. Um, and, and that's, like, the issue for me. Other applications, other use cases, 100%. I think it's a great idea. But for finance in particular, I think it's, you know, I think it's very, very problematic from that standpoint. Um, also, you know, you, you also have a scenario, like, L2 is kind of like writing a check, you know? I mean, if we're gonna make it super simplistic versus paying somebody cash. And, you know, checks can bounce. You know, things can happen post facto. So I, I, I just think that, you know, these are great designs and they're scaling for different use cases and that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, it, it is important to also understand like kind of some of the innovations that blockchain's brought and, and make sure that we keep those, some of those nice properties. Yeah, and just one interesting thing that Ilya mentioned also is that we are indeed, uh, the, the kind of the lines between layer one and layer two are starting to get a little bit blurry. Yeah. And especially now with, you know, uh, um, the, the most critical point in current multi-chain infrastructure are definitely bridges. And this is where we see the most of the recent hacks and whatnot. So this is something that the, the industry is kind of focusing on. And one, I guess, one of the most promising designs is where you actually use ZK proofs to, to prove the, the activity on corresponding chain on this chain, on the destination chain, if you will. And again, you can argue that this is kind of blurring the lines between layer one and layer two. So if you have an alternative layer one that is communicating with Ethereum using the ZK proof uh, based bridge, I mean, then it becomes a matter of narrative. You can call this bridge actually a layer two of Ethereum or scaling solution of Ethereum. And, but basically, yeah, that's something that's also interesting to, to kind of note. Yeah, I mean, I think in general, ZK is, is how we actually unify all those visions, yeah. right? Very, like, very likely. Very pretty likely. much. Yeah. Very likely. Because we'll have like a proof that everything is executed and you cannot roll back that already. And so then it will be, you know, 
data availability, it will be still finality because zero knowledge probably will yeah. take longer to actually execute, but at the end it will be kind of a singular model that scales because you can execute in parallel and then just prove your part. I would say that's the most likely future. Yeah. Super I, I, I just <laughs> zero knowledge super I, I, I just <laughs> Zero knowledge, like you can't, th those don't solve the issue of having separate finality. Like, they're very yeah, useful yeah. and they're very powerful for a lot of things, but like fundamentally, um, fundamentally if, you, if you have separate finality, one chain can roll back and the other one won't. And then it doesn't matter that you proved something about the state at some point, because the state could be changed now. Um, that, that's kind of, I think, a very critical point. And just another point that I wanted to mention from earlier is just in, in terms of kind of Ethereum security itself, one of the things that I think um, the roll-up teams are, are very excited about is, is the fast approaching merge, um, which will bring Ethereum off of proof of work entirely onto proof of stake, which is going to significantly improve kind of the finality properties of the chain and do a lot to really sort of ramp up the power that roll-ups have. Guys, I want to maybe bring us up here a little bit to talk about something a bit more high level. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. It's go. fun. I was like, I'm not going to get into like, weeds. Should we, here we are. Should we get a whiteboard? Or? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask almost an annoying question here, which is like, let's talk about timeline a little bit, right? Um, right? Um, We've been talking a lot. Like, that. you know, obviously these are all moving <laughs> targets and everything like that. But ultimately, I think the future that we all want, however it looks, right? However many layer ones, whatever the diversity of layer twos is, we want people to be to be able to leverage these networks, right? Like, how long do we have before companies, entrepreneurs can easily start spinning up projects and aren't limited by kind of bandwidth type constraints? Um, so I heard earlier today that with money you can roll back, enough money you can roll back anything. So Optimism's new strategy will be to complete the protocol, then pay enough to roll back time. So it's coming tomorrow. <laughs> it's uh, like Superman when he's flying around the world, right? He makes yeah, it go yeah. backwards. You um, cannot disprove that you cannot do that. Though. Uh, zero knowledge, I could. Uh -huh. um, I mean, look, I mean, look, I think the answer is from everyone is going to be, right now, come use my scaling solution on my panel, right? But it's true. You can go on Optimism right now. You get those instant transactions. You get cheap fees. And it's EVM equivalent. So it is like true one-click deploy. Use all the tooling, everything you love about Ethereum. So yeah, <laughs> woo! Um, you know, with that being said, there's a long road ahead in scaling. And it's definitely the case that the end game is coming into sight. I think this is something that I've observed in the past year, two years, that is notably different from earlier iterations of scaling, where I feel like there's a very consistent framework in which I can put all the pieces of the different things I see people saying. Um, and it turns out that the, all those paths are kind of leading to the same place. So shout out to Vitalik's end game post if you want to get technical. But um, in general, I think we have years, but I think the next step is going to be adoption. Like we're in a bear market now, right? And so the next thing is like, telling people about this, I'm less worried about a bunch of congestion and this generation of scaling not getting there. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned with bringing on applications and users that actually align with the values of what we're trying to build in the first place, so. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think, like, right now you can do a bunch of stuff, and, I mean, a lot of people are building, I think, across all of the ecosystems, and we see probably kind of the biggest shift in kind of what, you know, Web2 traditional tech of people actually coming to Web3 because they're realizing the values, they're realizing that the stuff actually works. Um, and there's, you know, this promise here. Even, even with, you know, events of last week, there's still lots of interest that, uh, like, for people to actually build. And that is the most amazing part. Like, starting in 2018, when, you know, market was going down, everything was crashing, people were kind of exiting, and, like, actually, like, going through that building through that, like, scene right now, like, this, nothing like that, right? Like, people actually, you know, continue building, nothing changed. So, I think from that perspective, we're there. There's obviously, like, all of us have, you know, huge technical roadmaps that we continue building on, right? I mean, for, uh, in many ways, like, for near, right, it's how do we dynamically resize the network, right? Like, on a basis, you can think, like, near block size is actually, like, adjustable. And so we can actually keep growing the block size as there's more usage. And so right now that requires like a governance vote and you know more kind of more validators coming in uh, on like at the basis of that. And so how do we move to fully dynamic kind of you know out of provisioning type of thing? So like dynamic resharding we call it. And so when that is launched, that allows to actually like completely scale with more applications launching 
uh, into the network. At the same time, we already have you know, Octopus, which allows us to launch parachains and kind of style app chains on near, and so you're still able to already, and already like, like eight chains already launched that way to scale out that way and still have similar like, kind of same wallet experience across them. So like you already can scale. There's private shards launching, which allow you to run kind of enterprise or like private use cases as well. So there's a lot of stuff launching, more infrastructure. All of it is, you know, building out, kind of maturing through usage. So please build. Yeah. Um, I obviously agree. As, as I said in the, in the beginning, these are obviously the, the, the early days, the early phase of the industry, and we have, as Ilya said, a huge uh, uh, technical roadmap ahead of us. Of course, we can offer solutions today, which are basically our supernets, our dedicated blockchain network that we offer through our Edge framework, and they are available today, and there's more than 40 networks, 40 networks currently in, uh, being built, some of them already in production using that framework and they can support, like with, with that uh, dedicated network, you can easily, I guess, accommodate uh, up to maybe 50 million user base or something like that. So, so we have solutions today, but are these solutions ideal? Of course not. Uh, do they have the level of security, level of uh, scalability, robustness that we want them to have? Absolutely not, and we will need years to get there. And basically this, again, it's important to remember, for, for us at Polygon, it's imp it was always important to offer something to users, to offer something today, and then in parallel actively work on pushing the frontier of innovation, develop, developing uh, more, more secure, more robust, more scalable solutions, and that's exactly what we're doing. And like, we're still basically even in the phase of active experimentation. Like on the ZK front, we have four different uh, projects that we're experimenting with, and we still expect to see some convergence, and that's somewhere ahead, maybe one one year from now or so. So definitely early phase. We definitely have solutions even today, but that's not where we want to be as an industry and as a project. Yeah, yeah I, I really agree with Mihalo. I mean, you know, we have solutions today to actually be able to scale um, to large amounts of transactions without much friction for users uh, via subnets. So we have um, two subnets that are in production, um, both of them doing about, uh, I would say, 800 to 900,000 transactions per day, um, maybe like a hundredth of a penny in terms of a transaction cost fee. Um, those are obviously not ideal, like you mentioned, in terms of you know, the decentralized set of validators that you want. Um, however, it is nice to have this you know, um, validator set that is parameterizable, whatever the hell the word is. Um, so I, I think that's quite nice, but at the end of the day, um, it's also nice that the system self-scales itself. So we had an application on the C-chain that, that moved over to a subnet. When that happened, um, we increased the transactions per second that the network was, was actually handling while lowering fees on both the subnet and the main chain. That's quite nice scaling, so that's possible. My bigger question is like, you know, um, do we actually have the demand that we want uh, to actually, um, you know, d does the space have enough demand? You know, I think we can increase block space right now, today, um, you know, in a reasonable way. Uh, are there enough use cases? You know, DeFi's two years old. Uh, you know, I think we're learning a lot about it given the recent events and, and kind of, you know, what's going on in the industry. Do we have enough use cases? Is there enough demand for block space, for transactions? Uh, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to actually figure out um, what are, you know, what are uh, reasonable use cases for blockchains that scale, that users want to use, and then fix the UX over time. So I think we could scale today. Uh, I think it'll get better over time, um, but we also need to figure out the adoption part a little bit faster. Yeah, I think I'll just, I, I mean, I think uh, both mirror Ben's answer, essentially, of the fact that I think on Ethereum there's like great solutions live today. Arbitrum's been live for quite a while now. Optimism's been live for quite a while now. Um, you can use tons of stuff already. I think the thing I will add on um, in my answer would be that I think over the next year, there's gonna be a lot of progress. Um, both, I know we're working on our, on our Nitro release right now, which is going to both cut prices, increase capacity, and do a lot of great things. I know that you guys are also working on Bedrock, which, which has a lot of uh, improvements as well. We're also extremely excited about the Ethereum scaling roadmap, which would be able to cut data posting costs by a lot, which should make roll-up transactions much, much cheaper. I think that kind of the systems that are there today are great, but I think that like they're nothing compared to what things are going to look like in the next, hopefully in the next year. 
All right, guys. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Fascinating conversation. Guys, everyone give them a big round of applause. Woo!